Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the British Library this evening for Br Chinese and British, the conversation. This evening's conversation is one of the first events supporting our current exhibition, Chinese and British, Gong Xu Yinghua. I'm Han Lingxie, one of the Chinese collection curators at the British Library. I'm also one of the internal curators curating the current exhibition, Chinese and British, Gong Xu Yinghua. Chinese and British is an exhibition exploring British Chinese communities and culture. In addition to the rich collection from the British Library, including manuscripts, books, newspapers, photos, and oral histories. The exhibition also involves long items from the local private owners to tell the story of their communities. From the first documented Chinese person who visited the country in 1687, until today, with the highest number of Chinese people in the UK, the exhibitions showcase Chinese communities' stories from their significant, significant contributions in wartime service and national careers to outstanding achievements in literature, sport, music, fashion, and so on. This exhibition runs from 18 November 2022 until 23rd April 2023. Please come and visit the exhibitions. Before I invite our guest speakers to the stage, I would like to start by welcoming all of you in the entrance hall for joining us in this event. I also would like to um, extend a very special welcome to those of you who join us online. I hope that you will enjoy this evening or depending on which time zone you are, enjoy the morning and afternoon. We will be taking questions from our online and in-house audience. If you are watching online, please submit your questions using the questions box, uh, question box below the video. And for our audience in the theater, please just raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. If you are watching online, you can use the menu above to provide us with feedback on the event, to donate to the British Library, and to find out more about our guest speakers. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair for the evening, George Ma. Fong Pui Yu. Uh, George is the creator of the broadcast Chinese Chippy Girl, where she brings guests on the show to bring better representation of the East and Southeast Asian community and to amplify their voice. Let's welcome Georgie. Got water on my um, pad. Hi everyone, this is so exciting. Oh my goodness, there's so many faces. Hi, Shu. <laughs> um, so, yes, welcome to the Chinese and British conversation at British Library. So, so exciting. I can't believe this actually event is actually happening for the 10 year old self in me that never thought that we would actually have a space in somewhere like this. So, I'm just going to say one, one more time, just repeat myself. There's a Chinese, British Chinese exhibition in the library talking about our culture, our heritage, and our upbringing as well. I feel like we can clap, right? We can be loud. I know we're in a library, but like, come on, we're good. <laughs> it's after hours. I love it. Yeah. So the um, Chinese and British exhibition is on downstairs. 
It's on till the 23rd of April. I'm so ecstatic that there's actually a conversation about this. And it's not even just about being British and Chinese. It's our EC community as well, EC, East and Southeast Asian uh, community. I'm just going to park this conversation to one side. There's actually another, uh, another event happening in East London that's hosted by my friend Anna Chan from Asian Leadership Collective. And they're talking about EC Eats. Now, a few people have said to me, oh, George, I'm really sorry, I can't come to the event. I'm going to go to the event talking about EC Eats, which is basically talking about East and Southeast Asian uh, food. And I was like, do you know what? Don't be sorry. I just think it's so amazing that there's actually a choice in events on our, on our community. And it's not even just about that. There's so many EC organizations as well. There's BC, British East and Southeast Asian Network, really advocating for the EC community. There's also EC Sisters or ESEA Sisters as well, where they've created a really safe space for EC women and those in the LGBTQIA community as well. There's also On Your Side, I don't know if they're here tonight. Raise your hands if you are here, no? Okay, don't worry about that. Um, they are UK support network for the EC community who are experiencing racism and hate. But just going back to this agenda on our conversation, British and Chinese, I'm joined by some amazing panels here as well. I'm going to start off with my takeaway sister, Angela Hoy. Hi, Angela. Hi. <laughs> So Angela is an author of Takeaway Book. Put your hands up if you read the book. Yes. Oh my God, so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, also a food journalist, born in Wales, fellow Takeaway sister. Um, Angela, do you want to tell us more about your background? Um, yeah, sure. I was born in Wales, and I'm from a little place called Bather, which is in the Welsh Valleys. And um, I, like Georgie says, I grew up at a Chinese takeaway, and we lived above it. We owned it for 30 odd years. And then I moved to London to become a journalist, and I used to work at like various places like Vice, HuffPost, and Time Out. And um, now I'm currently an editor at an app called Recce, which is a startup. But yeah, that's pretty much it, I think. So Angela, tell us about why it was so important for you to write a memoir to write a book about takeaways? Um, I just felt that, you know, there was just so many stories about um, the Asian American experience. Like, yes, there were similarities, but they weren't exactly the same. And it was always, I never really felt I could relate to certain things in terms of like, especially growing up in a place where it's very rural. You know, me and my family were like one of the only Chinese families where we were. And, um, and I never really felt that community because it was a very isolating experience growing up in, you know, in a very white dominated neighborhood. So I guess like in America, you have all these like really big Chinese and like East and Southeast Asian communities, say like LA or San Francisco or New York, where, you know, you felt like you had a space to go, but where I was, it was, very rare and it was either like family or friends so i felt like and i know there were so many other chinese takeaway kids like me but because we're all in different areas and very rural parts like in scotland or in you know in bournemouth and brighton and you know it was a very isolating experience i really wanted to tell that story of you know feeling lonely not really sure where your footing is in the world you know am i a white person or am I Chinese or, you know, it was this very conflicting identity of not knowing where I am. So it really felt like made me want to write about the story. And I think growing up in a takeaway at that time, you never really thought of anything different. You just thought like, oh, this is just normal. This is the way of life until later on, as you grow older, you start to kind of really reflect on your upbringing and the person that who you are. So yeah, I guess that's what it was really essentially. I think when reading your book, it just brought back so many memories to me, like working behind the shop or working behind the counter. Um, so for those that don't know, um, I'm also a, a chippy girl as well. Um, I had to take, mum and dad had a takeaway in, in Macclesfield in south of Manchester. And 
I'll be honest, I hated it. Hated every single second of it. I hated serving the chips. I hated working with my parents. Hated speaking Cantonese. I just hated everything about it. Um, fast forward like 30 plus years later, I now have a podcast about it. But I think reading your book, there was, there was um, okay, so there's, there was two mental sides of me when reading your book. There were times when I thought, okay, I can't read anymore just yet because I'm starting to get really emotional, especially things that were quite triggering about the racism. Mm -hmm. But then there was things like just your stories of, you know, when you were working with your brother, you were out on the deliveries with him. I just thought, oh, you know what, that's quite fun. Because there were some highlights of working with, with family. Um, I felt like you got on much better with your brothers than you get on with <laughs> my little brother. Not. <laughs> so, and tell us about um, some of the, the writing that you've done as well um, on your journalism. Yeah, um, so I guess like one of the first pieces I ever wrote, um, I guess I you know, wrote what I knew, and that was Chinese food or identity, and um, I really, the first piece I ever wrote was about dim sum trolleys in the UK. I think it was, I just noticed that, you know, the, the one Chinese restaurant in Wales called Happy Gavrig, which I loved, and I used to always go there every Sunday before Chinese school, which was my parents' uh, blackmail incentive. Like, you get to have dim sum, <laughs> but then you have to go to Chinese school afterwards to learn Cantonese. Um, and they used to have dim sum trolleys, and there was, used to be quite a lot of places in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. So it was like a big, imagine like, um, you know, like an air steward, and you have like the, uh, the trolley, and you have all the bits of dim sum, and there'd be a woman just shouting um, what they have on their cart. So you have like chung fun, and you've got, you know, rice and glutinous rice and all that. They'll be like shouting what they have. But they were dying out, so I wrote a piece about it saying I really miss them, even though they're not like the freshest in the world because it's like pre made and then you just pick off whatever. And then it just kind of grew from there, and I didn't realize that, you know, there's a space to write about, like really niche. In my eyes, then I thought it was really niche writing about Chinese food, and you know I've always been kind of writing about and talking about things that I knew. You know I've written um, during when the height of COVID. I wrote about COVID-related hate crimes and the rise of it. I spoke to a lot of victims and like Chinese community centres and the things that could be done in terms of you know tackling um, Asian hate and talking to the victims in terms of like this, telling their story and that like those things really mattered to me because, you know, at the COVID gave, um, you know, a face to all the hate and, you know, I get it because during COVID, it was a horrible time. People, you know, lost loved ones, people lost work. So they targeted all of that hate to Asians because, you know, they had, they wanted someone to blame. And I guess, yeah, that's kind of a lot of the work that I've done that I've always been, you know, very proud of the work that I've done in terms of like advocating in terms of like Chinese food, you know, fighting our corner, fighting our little space. And yeah, so I feel like very like, I'm glad to be able to have that space to be that person to be able to write it. Um, yeah. Aww. Well, I have to say, I'm a diehard fan of your, of your articles. Um, thank you, Angela. Um, next up, we've got singer-songwriter. I actually can't believe I'm saying this because I've been such a big fan of you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm fangirling you here. OK, be professional. OK, singer-songwriter, performed in Glastonbury this year, um, has a single called Ritual that's featured on BBC Introducing and Spotify. Um, your massive voice for the LGBTQIA community uh, Jason, do you want to tell us more about yourself? Um, sure. Hi. I feel like you've covered it. That's all I am. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jason Kwan. I use he, they pronouns. I am a queer non-binary singer-songwriter from Hong Kong. I moved here when I was 14, uh, and I've kind of been here ever since. Um, I also work a lot within the cabaret scene. I help run a queer Asian cabaret collective called The Bitten Peach, and we platform Asian artists from all different disciplines and put them on stages and train them up and make sure that they, ha they have a voice to be exactly who they want to be on stage. Um, for the past five years, I have worked within the LGBTQIA plus homelessness community, um, supporting homeless youth all over the UK between the age of 16 and 25, um, helping them with independent living, with housing, uh, with education, and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of, yeah, like, through my music, I sing a lot about really authentic experiences I have and 
my aim is to put more Asian stories into the mainstream and make sure that we are heard and for us to fuck things up, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I'm really happy that you're running stage, not because I'm a super fan, <laughs> but also I think it's really interesting to hear your voice as well, particularly because um, you're, you're part of the LG uh, TBQIA community, but also you moved over from Hong Kong as well. Um, when you decided to move to the UK, what were, so we, did you say you were 14 when you mm. moved over? Like what was going through <laughs> your mind? Were you excited? Were you like, oh my God, what's, ha what's, what's happening? Or it was, it was interesting. Um, I, I, so growing up in Hong Kong was kind of difficult. I was, and still am very camp and very femme. And growing up in, growing up is difficult for everyone, but I think as a femme person within very hetero environments, it's quite difficult for me to just be myself. And I was bullied quite badly at my school in Hong Kong to the point where I would skip class. I didn't turn up to things because I was like, why should I turn up if I'm just gonna be hated on? Um, so I floated this idea to my mom to go to the UK and she was very much like, well, your sister got a sports scholarship. That's why she can go. We can't afford to send you. So I was like, okay, well, let me audition for a music scholarship. And I also wrote a letter to the school asking them to pay for the rest of it. And I was like, if they could, you know, give me a hardship fund, that'll be great. And the school were like, yep, we'll do that for you. Um, and so I got an incredible opportunity to leave a homophobic environment to a place I've never, ever visited by myself, knew nothing about, and just like turned up. Um, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> you know what I thought was, oh, you know what, I've, I've seen queer people in the media, but they're all white. So they're here, they're in the UK, they're in America, like they're in Euro Europe, um, I'm sure they exist here. Um, but when I turned up, it was an independent all boys boarding school. <laughs> and I was like, cool. <laughs> and so it was, cut, it was pretty bad there as well, but there was another part which, plays into intersectionality of the crossover of my identity, which was that I was Chinese, you know, I was Asian, I was East Asian, I was something that they um, kind of put into a box. So I had to kind of battle both of those things at the same time, but there were so many factors that I had to consider and deal with, and I was 14, and I was trying to navigate all this by myself, and I was not about to cry to my parents because they didn't know I was queer, so I wasn't gonna tell them what was happening. So it was a very interesting, time in my upbringing, I think, um, yeah. And you were 14 as well. I don't know about you guys, but when <laughs> I was 14, I, I thought, I don't know, I was just like the worst person ever. So negative, hated life, hated everything. So. Well, I was a terrible person too, but I just also <laughs> like went through a lot of such other a, things. I was such a terrible teenager. <laughs> um, thank you, Jason. Um, next up, we've got uh, Amy Fung as well. Born and bred in London, core member of BC. Britain's East and Southeast Asian Network, really advocating for the EC community. Um, and yeah, um, Amy, before I say any more glowing <laughs> things about you, do you want to tell us more about yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm a British Chinese Londoner and I feel like a big part of who I am is actually because of where my family came from. So my great grandparents were from Southern China and because of war or conflict of political economic strife, they had to flee to Northern Vietnam, which is where my parents were born. And then they grew up, um, obviously met each other, had kids. And then because of the American Vietnam War and because of other wars too, the Sino-Vietnamese War, they again had to flee because it was dangerous to be Chinese. And they took themselves. So my parents at that time must have been around 30, 33 years old, I believe. Them and their four children um, got into a boat and they basically had to leave en masse with several hundred thousand other oh, wow. what they call now boat people. But um, I think a lot of people would rather be called um, forced migrants. And then they went out to sea, obviously extremely traumatic time, ended up in Hong Kong where they lived in a refugee camp for I think a few months. And then they got resettled in the UK. And then I ended up being born in the lovely leafy suburb of Farnham. <laughs> And uh, my older sister as well. And um, yeah, and then skip a few years, be seen started. Yay! <laughs> so hold on, let's just go back a little okay. bit there. Just go back. <laughs> back. So 
You're one of five. Yeah. No, six. You're one of six. Okay. Yeah. Oh, geez, right. Okay. <laughs> so you're one of so you're one of six. So the first four siblings, were they born in Vietnam? Yeah. They and, were. and number five in you, five and six. So are you the youngest? I am the youngest oh, on the baby. You can tell you're the youngest as well. So <laughs> Child number five and six, were they born in the UK? Yeah. Ah, okay then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have, do you feel like you have um, a slight cultural difference with your older siblings then? Yeah, first of all, I want to pay tribute to the older siblings because I think they went through a lot. Not only did they have to navigate all of that, they also ended up being in the country where they couldn't speak the language, everything's new to them, it was cold, um, the food was completely different, and they also had to navigate my parents' differing expectations for them as well. So I, I really pay tribute to my older siblings because they went through a lot. And then I came along, I had no idea what was going on. You know, I didn't go through all of this. I had, you know, the time of my life. And um, yeah, I definitely think that I had very different experiences from my older siblings, that's oh. for sure. Um, okay, so let's fast forward a few more years. Mm. BC. Yes. Tell us more about BC and how it started. We've got some BC members here as well. Gonna shout out Carly and Izzy. Come on, say hello. Wave your hands, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. You know what? I was actually gonna go, yeah, stand up, BC. But I remember I put you on a spot last time. Yeah. I'm nice to you guys, you see. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Britain's East and Southeast Asian Network, we started a couple of years ago. Uh, because we noticed that there was this really worrying uptick in anti-East and Southeast Asian racism. And that was obviously due to the COVID pandemic. The reporting in the media was calling it the China virus. I definitely felt a sense of anxiety, really palpable fear when I left the house. And whenever I tried to speak to anyone about it, I always felt like um, maybe they wanted to help me feel better. They said, no, it's all in your head, it's not real. And I felt I needed to connect with people who actually understood me. And so you do what you do when you're locked down in a pandemic with nowhere else to go, you go online. And um, I met so many awesome other people and that included some of the BC team. And uh, Viv Yao, shout out to Viv Yao. She started a petition. <laughs> yeah, Viv Yao, come on, let's give her a clap. <laughs> She started a petition to call on the media to stop using images of East and Southeast Asian people in corona-related articles, especially when it was unnecessary. And um, from then on, we you know, influenced the first ever anti-racism racism debate in Parliament, which was chaired by Sarah Owen. And a couple of months after that, we started the platform Be Seen because we felt like there wasn't a space where we could talk about our experiences in a safe way arena you know where people didn't judge us where we could be vulnerable so we do lots of different kinds of things we publish articles we create educational resources we act as consultants so if any company wants to be culturally sensitive um, they can approach us we have a podcast called but where are you from and um, one of our major projects is starting the first ever east and southeast asian heritage yes. month in the uk it happens every year in september where we invite people to create an event talk about who they are explore east and southeast asian identity and just enjoy yourself so no georgie you did an amazing podcast recording with Angela here about the takeaway experience and Jason you performed in Rewave which was an incredible musical event featuring all EC artists so it's been a really sort of validating space where I've been not only being able to meet so many incredible people but learn more about myself as well. Oh, <laughs> so lovely. Oh be seeing you guys. Okay I'm going, to be, I'm going to be quite serious now, okay? I want to talk about relationships with our families. And I actually feel like this is going to be like therapy. Because I think, so basically with my, um, with my parents, um, they were both born in China. They were raised in Hong Kong. And then they came, they moved over to the UK in the 60s and 70s. And they met in my Gong Gongs, my granddad's um, Restaurant, Chinese restaurant in Liverpool. And I'm, in, I'm 40 now, and I still have a really, uh, like a really, oh, how do I say it? Because I'm, I'm, I think my mum might be watching, so how do I say this? Um, Just say it. <laughs> Just say it. It's like, hi, mum, if you're watching. Um, but I, I'm going to be honest, I feel I have a challenging relationship with my mum. A, because um, I, I'm, I think 
very British and she doesn't think British. Um, B, my Cantonese is, is extremely broken. It's getting a bit better. Uh, like I, I can go into Chinese restaurants and they can understand what I'm trying to order in rather than saying to me, can you just say it in English, please? Um, and I think because of those because of those barriers, the cultural difference, the cultural barrier and also the language barrier, I feel I have a kind of disconnected relationship with, with my parents. And I think when I was growing up, seeing my white friends have such a close relationship with their mums, I got so jealous. Like they go shopping together, you know, some of my friends at school, they got the heart broken, they'd go to their mum. I could never do that to my mum. My mum would never hug me, like, I'd, like my mum's never like pat me on the back or touch my hair or anything like that. So I just want to ask, did any of you, do any of you have this relationship with your families as well? Like disconnected, challenging, go. Anyone? Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> you can go first. Oh, oh God. <laughs> like PTSD. Um, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like we've only like started to really hug and talk about feelings and telling each other we love each other. But I guess growing up, you, you are sorry. What? You tell each other you love each other. Yeah, like now Are we you? do. Now we do. What? Not then. <laughs> Not then. Now we do. Do they say Only because I forced them to. Oh, you forced yeah. them. Tell oh, yeah. me you love me. <laughs> do they, do they say <laughs> Hold on. Got to be serious. Here. But do they say it to you first, or do you have to say it to them? No, I have to say it to them. <laughs> I have. Say it in English. Sorry, so yeah. many questions. No, 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 no. Only like now. Yeah, I say I love you now. Really? Yeah, yeah. Now I do oh. because I forced them to say it to me. Like, tell do you. Do they not get awkward or anything? I think they do a bit, but then I think. You know, I force them to like smush Aww. them into me. <laughs> I want to be loved, you know. Um, but no, absolutely not. Like growing up was such a minefield, you know. Um, me and my mum were like butt heads all the time because I, you know, I desperately so wanted to be white. You know, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to, you know, fit in with my classmates. I dyed my hair every color of the sun. I smoked. I drank. My parents hated me. <laughs> and, you know, I would actually, like, sneak out. Sorry, Mum, if you're, like, listening. Like, uh, <laughs> after, like, working in the takeaway, you know, I would work front of house serving customers. And then, like, after 11 o'clock, I would, like, sneak out, go to house parties <laughs> and, you know, go out. And, um, you know, so we were always constantly butting heads. And, um, and we always felt quite distant, especially growing up, because we never really understood each other. And I think the language barrier also was such a big thing because my Cantonese is also similar. It's not very good. I would say I'm more of a Western, you know, because I grew up in Wales. I was a very Western-centric growing up. And, you know, there were certain things I couldn't really explain or talk to them about, like mental health or talking about issues that really bothered me, like being bullied in school or, you know, I was ha like, having bad grades, I was like struggling in school and I couldn't really convey the message to them. You know, our conversations were very surface level conversations. It was always very like, oh, which means like, have you eaten yet? So it was just like, you know, as if asking very just, are you okay? Or never really get into the depth of the problem. So our relationship was always quite, you know, fractured because of that. And, you know, because we worked in the takeaway, there was no time to talk about feelings or how we were because we were always just too busy to work in the shop. You know, we, you know, the hour, our, our hours were like five till 11, but, you know, that was just opening hours. There was a lot more, you know, my parents would get up at, you know, like 10 a.m., like, you know, much earlier than that, to start prepping, you know, they would spend all day chopping mushrooms, chopping char siu, making curry mm. sauces, and, you know, and then we also went to school, and after school we would help out, so I, would, I remember, like, working in the, you know, counter, still in my school uniform, serving people, or, you know, giving cans of Coke to people. <laughs> so, yeah, there was just, our lives revolved around the takeaway, and there was just no time for anything else in terms of, you know, having a proper family outing. We never had hot, like holidays. I mean, the only holiday we would have is to go to Hong Kong. We would, you know, to see family really. So it didn't really feel like a holiday. Mm. Um, so it would always just be like seeing family and we never really had time to really just mm. enjoy each other's company yeah. other than, you know, sick fan, which was having a meal. So it was like before the shop opened, my parents would always force us to have family meal together. So that was the only time we would really cherish to really eat. But we never really talked when we eat it because we were just too busy 
putting food in our mouths and then during middle of the family meal, someone would call in an order before to get in early. So mm. there was never really any time. Yeah. You know what, you said all that. I still can't <laughs> believe you tell your parents that you love them. <laughs> <laughs> now, only now, only now. Like, it's, it, you so know, it's, it's yeah. taken a long time to get there. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's, we never really talked about how much our feelings, and it was only really since I wrote the book, and then during the book I interviewed my parents, talking to them about their past. You know, my mum grew up in China, she grew up in the Cultural Revolution, similar to like Amy. Parents like grew up through trauma, very distressing time. Like she swam the river to escape China to go to Hong Kong. Yeah. My dad was like a family of like eight, no, nine siblings and nine siblings, and you know he had a very scrappy childhood. There was never enough food on the table. And my parents, um, both my uh, grandfathers died when they were quite young, so you know they were no, they didn't have a father figure to provide for them. So they both had a very scrappy childhood, mm -hmm. and you know that kind of conveys across when, you know, they don't really want to talk about their past because it's very traumatic. So only until, you know, I wrote the book, I was, you know, had, we both had time because they had sold the shop then and they were semi-retired. So we were actually able to have the time to actually sit down, to talk to each other, to talk about the past, talk about feelings, to talk about, you know, relationships, mm -hmm. what was going on in our lives. And I think it was way better for it because I'd always try to keep that separate, like my personal life, because I don't want to bother with them with my personal life and my problems felt mundane to the shop. So, you know, it's only, it's, it's a very long and painful process and, mm. you know, a road to get to saying I love you, you know. <laughs> How about you, Amy, to you tell your family that you love them as well? Um, it shows itself in different ways <laughs> through, uh, I think, my family, more acts of service, mm. definitely. Yeah. So my mum would always do the traditional cutting fruit, yeah. um, giving it to me, making me drink some I'm thirsty, cooking loads of amazing food. But saying I love you, I think, is like getting blood out stone. Like, yeah. it'll never happen. <laughs> it'll never happen. But it shows itself in different ways. Have you told them that you love them? Because I say to my mum sometimes, I sometimes record it, and it's just so awkward. She's just like, why are you saying it for? And then, like, I love you in, uh, in Cantonese, it's more oily. She's like, hey, yeah, hold what that girl, which means oh, it's disgusting. I'm like, it's not what that, I don't really mean it. So just stop saying it now. Now, I will, I'll happily accept the food, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> I think the trick is, say it enough times to wear them down. Yeah, yeah. That's what I did see. <laughs> okay, oh. I've got to stop. Yeah. <laughs> now it's too awkward for me. No, too so awkward. I actually grew up saying I love you to my parents. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, really? it was kind of weird. <coughs> but it's like one thing that they did take on is to be like, I love you, good night. Like, oh. it was very sweet in that sense. Um, everything else was just their trauma, though. Like, if they still yeah. had the same reactions, you know, like, you say your parents grew up scrappy, and my parents grew up scrappy. Like, they didn't have, they were from broken families, they came from nothing, they had barely any food on the table, they had no father figures. Like, so when they barely have dealt with their own trauma, and when they are still kind of like children themselves as adults, how are they supposed to, you know, give you what you need? And so, like, I've had to really think back and like change my expectations on how I view them and what they could provide me because, in a sense, like, especially moving to a different country like mm. it's a whole different cultural experience and they're navigating it you're navigating it from a whole different perspective and you know when I came over um, they didn't know what it was like to grow up here right they had no clue and except for what I told them mm. but you don't tell them exactly how you're feeling most of the time like I would never say oh someone was being racist to me it's like that's the sort of stuff you keep to yourself it's almost like a known understanding that this stuff will happen to you. You just got to swallow and keep going. And that was what I was taught, right? Mm -hmm. So I would never bring that up because what were they going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And so it was like our way of like surviving by not talking about things mm -hmm. sometimes, which obviously, you know, is unhealthy. There are ways to do it. But I think at the time, they, they just didn't have the language to communicate that or feel that they could support me being so far away. Yeah. So. Something that you just mentioned in your intro is that when you moved to the UK when you were 14, your parents didn't know that you're queer. Mm. Do they know that you're queer now? Yeah, so I came out to my parents um, when I was 18, and I told them I was gay, and my mom didn't believe me. 
And I always thought it was kind of crazy to didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would literally run around the house, like, singing Lady Gaga at the top of my lungs. And she'd be like, yeah, you, well, she's female. You must love her because she's a woman, so you must be straight. Like, that was her, like, logical <laughs> reasoning. Um, like, they had no cultural context of what queerness was because they ne didn't know a single queer person. Um, I think I'm still the only queer person they know, which is crazy to think. Like, we're in 2022. Mm. Um, I don't think my mom doesn't really know I'm queer. You know, like that is such a new term for her or that I'm non-binary. In a sense, it's like, I don't feel like I have to have those conversations with her because those parts of my identity are so personal to me that as long as I know who I am, mm -hmm. that's fine. Like I don't really, like as long as no one's being insulting to me about who I am, it's chill. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, I feel like I don't have to explain to her fully. I would like to, it would be yeah. great to have a conversation with her like that, but. Um, I think it's also something so alien to her. Like, she doesn't understand, you know, how a queer person would survive in a society she grew up in, which is very, very homophobic, very transphobic. She's, she, you know, she told me, she was like, you've chosen a very difficult path to go down. Are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, mom, why would I choose to go down a difficult path? Like, this is just who I am. There's no choice about these things. And mm -hmm. that's taken her quite some time mm -hmm. um, to understand. and. Mm -hmm. I think me being in the UK and carving out my own space, she's seen that you know I can be myself and mm -hmm. do what I want to do. But I think her rejection of me comes from her being scared of like, oh no, I don't want you to do that because it's like from what I've seen, and we don't have many queer role models in Hong Kong at all. And the one person we had was Leslie Chung, who was a gay singer, and he ended up killing himself. Right, so. It's very difficult for my parents to think, oh, you can be a singer, firstly, like not a doctor or a lawyer, uh, but then also be queer on top of that and tell people you're <laughs> queer, that's crazy. Um, I remember my mom saying to me when I came out, she was like, it's fine, you can still marry a woman and just whatever you do behind the closed doors is your business. And I'm like, mom, I'm not gonna marry this poor woman and then <laughs> like, lie to her. <laughs> but it's like, it's for her, it was like anything but living as an out and proud queer person. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's much better now, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, speaking about relationships and stuff, I want to talk about dating as well. Um, because I remember when I was growing up, there was a lot of pressure on me from my family that I had to marry a Chinese person. Not only Chinese person, he's got to be rich. <laughs> Not from a takeaway background. I was like, how am I going to find one of them? So, and, um, so I've been in two relationships. Uh, both of them have been white boys. And the first boy that I went out with, my parents hated him. Oh my God, it was just awful. Like, it just felt like the family was going to break apart. But um, he turned out to be Mr. Wrong. I'm, a, I'm with a Mr. Right now. He's not here. He's, 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 with, he's hit somewhere. Hi, Ewan. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. No, it's come back. So okay. I just want to talk about, did any of you feel the pressure that you had to date a Chinese person, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think a lot of the tensions that we're talking about now, and that includes family relationships and dating, I think that really shows a tension between sort of Western individualism and Eastern collectivism. And I think living as a British Chinese person, we battle that a lot. Yeah. And I think, you know, say if you're like saying, oh, mom, I want to bring someone home. I, I know my mom will be like, yeah, but like you mentioned, is he rich? What's his job? Yeah. And it's really important, like his ethnic background as well. Whereas being brought up in London, especially, which is really multicultural, you sort of think, oh, that's really different from what I believe. And I definitely think being the youngest of six as well, I've had it quite easy in that mind. By the time it got to me, my parents were quite relaxed. Yeah. But I know for a fact that my oldest sibling, um, if they brought home a friend who happened to be a boy, like not even dating them, my mum would flip out because she's like, really? no, absolutely not. Like she's extremely <laughs> strict. And um, I don't know, it's, it's sort of a strange experience because we code switch a lot. Like mm -hmm. when you're out with your friends, you're a different person because you're used to, I don't know, growing up, I love the Spice Girls. Who loved the Spice Girls? You know, yes. like girl power. <laughs> it's all about expressing yourself, yeah. doing what you want, challenging the power. And then going home, you're just like, 
do absolutely what my mum and dad said. <laughs> and so I just rarely talked about boys or dating because I know my mum would just absolutely flip out and say no. So, um, yeah, it's that really weird tightrope walking of I need to please everyone mm. and straddling two cultures, essentially. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, Angela, you wrote about it in your book as well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly the same, like, pressures yeah. as Amy. You know, my parents were very, you know, you have to marry a Chinese boy. I think it was mainly for communication. You know, my mum really wanted to, you know, for me to go out with a Chinese boy because she was like, I want to talk to them. I want to get to know them, and I want to know if they're okay. Like, if they're right for you, I want to know their interests. And, you know, I've been with my partner, Tom, for, like, 13 years, we're like childhood sweethearts, wow. and even now, she's, my mum is still like, there's still time for you to like, <laughs> marry a Chinese boy, like she's still matchmaking. Or and Tom. Like, oh God, poor Tom. <laughs> like, is Tom him. here? No, he's not. Aww. Is he watching? <laughs> no, <laughs> probably Hi, not. Tom. He's working, it's fine. <laughs> and, um, you know, growing up, you know, whenever we went to dim sum, my mum would always try to like matchmake and try to set me up with a Chinese boy. She's like, oh, you know, so-and-so's son, he's really good looking, and like, marry this. Because as well, I guess, in Wales, it's like the, the Chinese or like the Asian, uh, like the male pool is very, very small. So it's like, there's only slim pickings <laughs> of who you can choose. So it's always like some, so-and-so's friend's like son or something, and like, I just had no interest in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to kind of explore dating in my, on my own terms, you know, I wanted to, find, you know, whoever. And I, I've, uh, had, I've actually had a conversation with my mum. I was like, if I wanted to go out with a Chinese boy, I would choose to go out with a Chinese boy, but there's just none in Wales, you know? Mm. And um, so I've always dated white guys because that was what was available to me. And, um, and like, the first time I brought back um, my boyfriend, well, the only boyfriend I've ever brought back is Tom because, you know, I've only known him since I was 18. And I was so, so nervous bringing back Tom. And he was... Ter like terrified. <laughs> so I guess I, I, you know, told him like what to do and bring. So I was like, you know, make sure you bring food, bring oranges, <laughs> bring for a rocher, you know, all the good things to like please <coughs> parents. And um, he was like, bless him, he's so nervous. And then my mum was just like so happy that he brought stuff. And um, <laughs> only because like I told her to. And then my mum being the feeder that she is, you know, similar, like my parents are like, so, like shows the way that they love you is through acts of service as well. Like they cook for you until you explode. So, <laughs> you know, my mum would make this massive spread and Tom, bless him, would just keep eating and eating. And he's like, I don't, I, I can't stop. But like your parents <laughs> keep feeding me. And I think that's when, you know, um, my parents like realized, oh my God, like this guy can eat. Like he's part of the family now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think at the time, um, like Tom was working a lot and he worked like three jobs, like straight out of uni. So they saw how hard working he was. And that's why they're like, oh yeah, he's, he's a good one. You know, he yeah. works, he works, he can eat. So that's why they love him. And, um, and I think as well, in terms of, you know, I still get a lot of pressure because, yeah. you know, we're, we've been together for so long. You know, I never really wanted to get married. I don't want to have kids. You know, I've always been very adamant of that because, you know, that's not what I wanted and neither does Tom. And, you know, my mum is always still very pushy on that, you know, yeah. all the time. She's like, when you get married, where's the kids? Where's my grandkids? You know, and I'm like, I'm not going to give it to you because that's not what I want. And it's a lot of pressure for me. And um, yeah, I always find like dating is quite difficult in that sense um, because of, you know, a lot of my older cousins and my, um, you know, they've all got babies, they've all got married, they've all got like the traditional route and I, this kind of black sheep in the family, you know, I don't want to marry, I don't want to have kids. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that's like dating has always been quite a difficult one just because, you know, I never really know where I stand in that sense mm -hmm. and, you know, my parents are still so pushy in that sense. I wonder how much of that stems from that yeah. intergenerational trauma and that survivalism that your parents experience. Because mm. I feel like their concern about who you're in a relationship with, your economic status is really rooted in the fact that they had really nothing yeah. when they were growing up. And in relation to my family, they lost everything twice over. So not only are they migrants once, but migrants twice through my grandparents. And I know that for my parents, ensuring my stability has a lot to do with them mm. still feeling the effects of losing everything. And um, it's similar in the way that when I brought people home, my parents would be really happy if they ate all the food and finished everything. Cause it's like, he's a good one because <laughs> he cares about food. And 
filling someone with that sustenance is a way of knowing, you know, they, they care about yeah. being healthy, which is something they lacked mm -hmm. the ability to do with freedom when they were growing up. So I think it's really rooted, I mm -hmm. think, in a lot of, of your past yeah. and your family's past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, our parents just want us to be happy with who we are, like, authentically. Like, mm -hmm. they, you know, at first they kind of put all these... Um, like la like things on you, it's like forcing you. Oh, you know, marry a marry a woman, or like you know, go out with someone that has is rich. And I think they just want you to be safe, happy, and just loved, essentially. Mm. And um, like, it, and I think they come to realization on their own terms, and then they realize like actually, you know, you'll be fine, and that they have to come to terms with it, no matter what, really, essentially. Yeah, yeah like their idea of success and happiness is actually very different. I think they see it as having loads of money, mm -hmm. being an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor, and actually being over here and having so much more opportunity and the privilege of language, the privilege of education, being able to use that. I think they realize there are lots of different ways mm -hmm. to be happy and to thrive, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look exactly like having tons of money in your yeah. bank account. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really interesting. Um, on the subject of dating, as uh, an EC person or a Chinese person, have you ever been objectified or fetishized? Go I on, mean, Jason. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> 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 um, if anyone's heard my latest song, it is just about that. Uh, it's called Ritual, and it opens with like you know, it talks about fetishization, yellow fever, being objectified, and I think especially growing up in the UK, when you enter dating, well, for me, it's like if I have date when I have dated non-Asian people. Um, I've, I've, like, I've always been exoticized. It's like, oh my God, it's so exciting. I've never dated a Chinese person before. And then I think, oh, like maybe this is normal. Like this is the type of dynamic that I'm supposed to have with my Western counterparts. And slowly I realized, no, it's like they are putting you into, you know, um, something that they want you to be or something that pleases them. And you start molding yourself to fit what they'd like. Um, and a lot of that has to do with racism and hierarchies of race. And mm -hmm. also what I, what I think is interesting as well is, you know, my mom never put that pressure on me um, because she was like, you should go date as many people as you want and find the right person. And I think that's because really? I grew up as a boy, right? Mm -hmm. And the dynamic, th that gender binary is so stark. Like, girls are supposed to do this and guys are supposed mm -hmm. to do that. And so I didn't actually have that pressure, but my sister, oh my God, she had so much pressure on who she was allowed to see, who she was allowed to date. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I came out, um, it was a whole different thing because my parents had no idea what that would mean for me. And my mom said something really funny. She was like, oh yeah, you know, from what I think, like gay people, like when they date, they date for life and they're just like, you know, they find their soulmates and they are together forever. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> I'll just like, mom, you've not met the guys in London. But, <laughs> um, but it's interesting how like they see that as something like positive, like what they can get out of it. But in terms of being fetishized, objectified, I've had to relearn how to date. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> um, and Jason, just whilst you're kind of talking as well, so I'm quite interested to learn more about um, your experience because cause you went to school, because you moved here when you were 14, you, you, you went to school in, in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and you also went to school here as well. Did you feel there was like a really big, um, like a huge difference between like, uh, like, like culturally? Yeah, um, so I went, into, I went to an international school in Hong Kong, which means it was an English language school um, where it was very international. Like I grew up with the whole spectrum of ethnicities and um, although I was a ethnic majority, I was surrounded by people from all over the world. And so when I went to the UK and everyone was very similar from a very similar economical background, um, who all kind of looked the same <laughs> and who spoke the same and um, were all white. It was very interesting because in Hong Kong, in our school at least, like we never said, this is how you do something. This is how we learn. This is how we speak. These are the words we use. We were very open to all the cultures because we grew up like that. But I think coming to the UK, it was like, no, like you can't speak like this or you're made fun for doing something different. Um, however, I would say because Hong Kong is still a colony, like the influence of British culture is very strong and like, 
being white was still seen as the coolest thing you could be, which I thought was crazy. The fact that I was living in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. being white was still held as oh, this really? like privilege because of you know, racism and colonization. Mm -hmm. And just like you, I had friends who were Chinese and would be like, oh, I wish I was white, it would be so much easier, which is crazy to me. Um, yeah, so th those are like sort of like cultural differences, but at the same time, like colonization really like pervades in Hong Kong, so. Yeah. yeah. And how did you find being like moving um, to UK, being a minority and also being part of the LGBTQIA community as well? Was that, was that, did you find that that was like more challenges versus, versus Hong Kong or was it? For sure. Um, you know, I think in Hong Kong, I was able to, because I think, you know, the spectrum of masculinity and femininity is quite different in Asia compared to the UK. Like, in Asia, I'm not seen as that femme. I'm still femme, but like not seen as high femme. Whereas here, I am the femmest thing. <laughs> and especially when you're at 14 and you don't want to police how you act, you just want to be yourself. Yeah. It was very difficult for me to shift because what I thought I was hiding in Hong Kong, I wasn't hiding in the UK. And that became an issue. And I, I put a video out during COVID um, where I talked about my first week in the UK. Um, I was like crossing the road to school and this car drove past and they threw a bottle at me. And they called me a chink. <gasps> and I was just like, welcome to the UK. Like, mm. this is what it's like. And that really like resonated deeply with me because I had never experienced that type of very outward, violent, aggressive mm. racism. I have only experienced it um, kind of like in microaggressions or, or like embedded in society or embedded in school culture of like, this is the hierarchy of race. So it was very stark to me and I, s I felt unsafe. I was like, if they're so happy to do that to me, what else can they do? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was when I was still figuring out my sexuality. I don't think I've even said to myself or understood that I was queer. So for me to have to like juggle all these things while trying to catch up at school, make friends, live on my own for the first time, like it was a lot. Yeah. But here I am, I'm okay, I'm okay, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so, oh, don't clap. Don't clap. <laughs> um, and what about, what about you two? What about your school life um, for you guys as well? Were you the only Chinese person at your school, the only POC or whatever other people? Yeah, so I went to a South London state school and I was very much mixing with people of lots of different backgrounds and heritage. And that was a really great experience. And, you know, I had friends from all over the place. And then um, for my secondary school, I actually entered public school. So um, not because we're rich, not because we could pay for it. I got through, through some scholarship arranged by my sister. Still don't know the details, somehow I got in. And that was actually mostly white. Mm -hmm. And so I was basically the, the poor kid <laughs> in the school. And um, there were not many other black or Asian or brown people, definitely much less. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt that more acutely. And I think um, what I experienced quite a lot as well is people homogenizing us and thinking, oh, if you're Chinese, you should hang out with the other mm -hmm. Chinese people, expecting us to like, get on yeah. and not realizing that we're very different mm -hmm. and you have different experiences and may not necessarily just have to get on mm -hmm. because we're Chinese. And I think that happens a lot through life. You see it in uh, media where people just see you and they think, oh, you're Chinese, you must think a certain way. And that's why Corona racism comes back because they think, well, you all carry the virus. Mm -hmm. And so I think my first experience of feeling like I had to conform to a certain way was other people assigning that to me at school. And, you know, actually I got on with lots of different people at school. Um, and sometimes they were Asian, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. But I think more often than not, people tried to say, oh, you should stick with that group. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What about you, Angela? Um, I mean, school was hard, you know. we went to a very white dominated school. I could probably count the amount of people of color on one hand. Um, other than like, you know, it was my brothers and then one of my best friends who's mixed race. And there was probably another kid. And then that was it. You know, it was hard when you have no one. 
uh, especially your, you know your teachers and everyone. Even the teachers were like racist to me. They would call me like oh Hong Kong, and you know people would bully me. They would do like the whole like slant eyes. And because I grew up in a Chinese takeaway, there would be rumors spread about me about like oh you know your parents uses dog and meat, dog meat, mm -hmm. cat meat, that was horrible. and like you know you. I had to kind of grow a really thick skin because of that. And I, I always felt like, oh, everyone's out to get me. Mm. You know, I hate everyone. So I was very, like, troubled as a kid. Mm. And especially, you know, I never really had a childhood because I grew up in the Chinese takeaway. So I was also never really had time to like, socialize with the other kids because I would constantly be working in the shop. And that was like an extra barrier. And, you know, working front of house, so I was be the face of the takeaway. So essentially, like, I had to take on everything in terms of, like, you know, being sexualized, being, like, all these, like, racist comments. And, you know, I had all these, like, older men that were, like, trying to, you know, I, I was eight years old when I first started working in the takeaway. So pretty much I grew up behind the counter. So I had all these, like, older men, like, asking me out on a date, like, oh, when can I take you to Hong Kong? Why can you be my, like, Asian bride? And it's like, you know, it's like really ick. You're like, oh my God, like, looking back on it, you're like, oh. But, you know, growing up, I never felt that because I just felt like, oh, this is just the way of life. This is the part and parcel. And, um, you know, so I've had, I never really had that experience of feeling I belonged anywhere because I grew up in such a, you know, uh, hostile environment, you know, and they were, it wasn't all bad, you know. I had a great support network. I had, you know, friends in school who were really supportive, people who saw that I was being bullied, they would stand up for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was very important for me to have a support network. And I also had loads of cultural spaces where my parents were very, you know, they forced me to go to Chinese school and I would go to dim sum and I would spend time at my cousin's place. So I always had a Chinese space because my parents would always force that on us you know and i would always go back to hong kong every year to see family so yeah i was always kind of juggling between like being white in school and then always had this like chinese-ness at home like where we watched you know chinese you know chinese channel at home we watched tvb we watched uh, cartoons wow. and i would read magazines in chinese so i like, always had you know both best of both worlds in a way and it wasn't until i really moved out until i went to, um, you know, moved to London that I found, you know, I felt more comfortable. And that was probably the first time I'm like, oh my God, there's like another Chinese person that's not my friend or like family friend or, you know, fam family. And that was like really mm. crazy to see that there was just more people out there like me. Mm. And because I kind of grew up in this bubble, I felt very, you know, in this like, isolated experience until like you it, you know I felt like I developed a lot later in life until my like 20s since I moved to London and then I kind of started to feel more myself like oh I found people like me and I connected through loads of people from online who also felt like the similar experience to me and that's when I really started to come out of my shell more you know I started to feel like oh this is who I am you know I'm both Welsh and I'm both like Chinese and that's when I, yeah, you kind of mm. start to realize, like, you kind of be on your path of, like, your identity mm. of realizing who you are. I think yeah. I experienced that as well, actually. And I almost see it as a cultural arrested development because when I was growing up and when I was most exposed to Chinese culture, when I was living with my family, you know, we listened to Canto Pop, The Four Heavenly Kings, <laughs> um, really famous four people who were like really big in Cantonese music. Right. We watched TVB dramas from a very specific time in the 90s. Mm. And um, when I left home, that stopped and I stopped interacting with that culture as yeah. much. And I always feel like when I think about the Chinese side of me, it's always stuck in time. Mm. It's like in stasis. Mm. And so when I think about Cantonese culture now or Hong Kong, I have a very different relationship with it and definitely through a political sphere as well because of what's happening there now I have to form a new relationship with it mm -hmm. but I definitely feel I resonate a lot with that in that trying to grow as a person has been delayed quite a lot because you're spending so much time to find out who you are because you're being pulled between two different cultures essentially mm -hmm. and so it's the same as you it's only really I believe much older now I've been able to, mm -hmm. to come into myself for example I tried to please my parents by going to finance mm -hmm. and if anyone knows me 
I cannot do maths. I'm so bad. You should not leave me in charge of your finances. I did that for seven years because I really wanted to please my parents. And then I was just like, you know, F this. I can't do it. And I retrained as a designer. So I'm a creative now. My parents are like, what? And they still don't really get what I do. But now, you know, at um, you know, advanced years, I finally feel like, oh, you know, I'm actually into who I am now. Yeah. Yeah, you know what, well, like with the Bid and Peach, so the Pan Asian Cabaret um, I helped run, it's really interesting because it's, we, we say Pan Asian because it's anyone who's lived in Asia, from Asia, whatever. Um, and everyone has a very different story. And a lot of, some people grew up here, some people immigrated, some people are first gen, second gen from all over Asia. And what I really love is seeing them reclaim and refine their identity mm. in that journey. Because as you said, like it kind of is arrested at a certain point when it's not being fed to you by your parents who are trying to mm. kind of uphold it. And that relationship of like, how do I still feel Chinese when I don't even speak Chinese, right? Well, I do speak Chinese, but like for those who don't, <laughs> um, it is difficult because like culturally, like how can I connect to somewhere where I've not even lived in, but people treat me this way, my blood is this. Um, and so I think, yeah, with the, with the cabaret, we do it on stage, you know, we help people like reconnect with their roots in that kind of organic sense. Yeah. yeah. Also on your bit of like coming to London and seeing other Asians, you should go to LA or San Francisco. It was crazy. I, know. I, was, there, I was there the last two weeks and I would walk out and like everyone's Asian. I was like, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. I, think I was just like jaw dropped. I was like, this is crazy. There's so many Asians. Yeah. My friend was like, San Francisco is like 40% Asian, like East Asian. Mm. And I was like, that's wild yeah. to me. Um, yeah, but anyway, let's yeah, No, because my colleague is from Toronto. She's like, if anything, we're outnumbering everyone else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're out. Like, like, um, yeah. So. Yeah. Actually, on our website, so last year for EC Heritage Month, we created a storytelling exhibition called Lancy Stars, and we interviewed and talked about people who were impacted by the American Vietnam War, and we got someone called Rachel Nguyen to write something about it for us. And she wrote... Um, about intergenerational trauma. It serves our lineage to thrive. And I think that really affected me because I think that's permission for us to not feel like we have to live up to our parents' expectation because they went through so much and suffered so much. I feel that as children of people who came from that generation, we feel like we need to justify what they went through and allow them to feel like everything that they suffered was worth it mm. and I think that looked a certain way when we were growing up you know being stable being mm. economically sound and I think now we're starting to reframe it and we're mm. seeing it as being able to be joyful being your full self and most importantly being able to rest because that's something they never got to do as soon as my parents hit ground in the UK it was just like you know survive survive live yeah. and live work you know you can barely stop to breathe and I think now with the advantages that I have felt from what they've given me, mm. I can finally actually just like chill, which yeah. is quite nice, and do stuff like be seen, which is very rewarding, which I don't think they would have had a chance to do in their time. Mm. Yeah. I think it's amazing how some, um, some of our parents who immigrated from Hong Kong, China, like I will never, ever, ever understand the hardship that they've gone through. I mean, yeah, you know, I feel like I've paid the quite a bad picture sometimes when talking about them on my podcast and oh, I don't get on that well with them. We've got, you know, culture challenges, um, sort of cultural differences, but I'll, I'm so grateful for everything that they sacrificed just so I can live comfortably. Um, but yeah, anyway, because mum's watching, isn't she? Um, very quick question before we go into Q&As. I just want to um, talk about what our favorite Chinese dish is. Sorry, talk about food. So completely change the subject. So <laughs> Sorry. Yes, anyway, our favorite Chinese uh, dish, you can choose one. Jason, do you want to go no, first? No, I want to go last. <laughs> <laughs> I need to think about it. You know, I actually created these questions and then I forgot to like work out in my head like what I was like. Um, <laughs> Whilst I'm thinking, Amy, do you want to tell us what your favorite Chinese dish is and why? 
So I know I'm going to betray Team Noodle now, because there's an ongoing debate between <laughs> Team Noodle and Team Rice. I love jo I love congee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think maybe because it's really cold outside and a bit chilly, and maybe I'm leaning more towards that. But I think that's just the ultimate comfort food. So for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a rice porridge that you boil for a long, long time, and the rice gets broken down. And you could put loads of different toppings on it. And it's just like a hug in a bowl. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Congee is so good. Yeah. I actually had that for lunch. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, I, again, like, I love congee. And there's this place in Satin that does chicken, uh, Satin, mm. and it's like the chicken in Hong Kong. And it's silky, it's so good. And it's like, ugh, again, like you said, it's like a hug in a ball. But it's, um, it was what I would eat when I was ill or when I was sick. And my mum would always make it for me. And it was because it's easy to digest. You know, mm. it's it's plain boiled rice, and then it's kind of broken down with like a watery porridge. It depends how thick you want it. I like it thick, <laughs> and you can have all these toppings to it. You know, you can have like spring onions, white pepper, pickled mm -hmm. bamboo shoots, and like fried gluten. It's almost like pick and mix that you can add all your toppings, yeah. or even add uh, yao zha guai, which is like the yu tao, which is a fried dough stick that you can like yeah. dip in. Um, I would probably say congee as well. Um, I love congee, but if not as a backup, I can't choose one. <laughs> but I loved, um, I just love the simplicity of steamed sea bass with ginger and yes. spring onions. Ooh, yeah. Like it's such a show stopping dish and it's so easy to kind of make because mm. you just, you know, have a fish, prep it and then put soy sauce and slice ginger and spring onion, and then put it in the steamer. And it just comes out amazing. You know, everyone's just always like, oh my God, that looks amazing. You put so much effort into it. But, but it's, it's like such a skill to serve it. it. Yeah, like it is. Like you have to really to know how to decant a mm. fish to just like, if, imagine if you're just given an entire fish, can you serve that to everyone? Mm. Like that is your job yeah. as the kid on yeah. the table to do it. I would eat the eyes. I yeah, know I people, love the eyes, people, the eye jelly. People get really freaked out and I'm like, I love the eyes. <laughs> eye out. jelly. <laughs> and then people like, get really freaked out, like, why are you eating the eyeballs? I'm like, yeah, but I love it. And then my mum's always like very happy. She's like, oh yeah, omega free, like eating the fish eyes yeah. is the best part for your brain. And, you, you know? and you can't flip the fish because it's like flipping, flipping, flipping a boat. Yeah, so it <laughs> you means... You have to finish one side. Yeah, so yeah. it means fan um, toll, which means like yeah. upsizing like your belly, which is bad luck, so it means it signifies death. Yeah. Yeah. You can never ever flip a fish. Yeah. So you always just take the bones, slide it out, and then you eat the yeah. yeah, unless you're like me, just <laughs> wait until no one's watching, just flip it over quick. <laughs> <laughs> really funny, my, my brother is here, he's why he grew up here, and uh, when he came to Hong Kong, I made, him, I made him eat a fish head, <laughs> and even I wouldn't do that, but I made him do it, and it was really funny to watch. You <laughs> made him do it. <laughs> oh. What's your favourite Chinese dish? Uh, okay, I'm going to say two, because I can't choose one. No, you can pick, um, no, pick one. I chose two. Okay, okay. Oh, okay, choose two. I'll choose one, okay. So, <laughs> I think because I grew up with it, and it's like a kid's favourite, it's sweet and sour pork. But like very specifically Hong Kong style, not that crazy shit they serve here. Um, <laughs> like with like proper like real pineapple that they properly steam and the sauce is a bit more viscous, not just like syrup. Um, but I, and like the pork is kind of um, battered really well and just, yeah, that's my favorite favorite. Um, my second favorite I would say is um, chicken feet in yeah. any style, yeah. <laughs> just serve me. <laughs> Chicken feet, goose feet, duck feet, like just give me feet. I love <laughs> poultry feet and that freaks people out here, but I'm just like, why would you waste, if you were gonna kill the animal, you better use all of it. Like, <laughs> so those are my two. Can we talk about texture? Because I feel like what's coming through here is like gelatinous, mm. yeah. sort of gloopy, texture I love that. Part it's of so eating. important. Exactly. People are afraid of texture in yes. the UK. It's yes. like, oh my God, it tastes rubbery. I was mm. like, yes, that's why I eat it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I know. Aww. I think my favorite's um, Su Long Bao, mm. Shanghai dumplings. I just love it when it's, um, like, and, and when they serve it to you, you have to eat it when it's hot because if it goes cold, then it just like solidifies. Oh, that's gross. And I love it when you just bite into it and then it bursts. It's like a volcano, it's like bursting <laughs> in there. And then like your tongue goes like really burnt. Oh, I just love it. So good, <laughs> so good. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I think we're just gonna go um, for some Q and A's. I've got some online Q and A's here as well, which I'll read out. Um, I think this is a question for us all. Do you remember the first time that you saw yourself represented in a book? And do you have any book recommendations that have inspired or helped you? Mm. Uh. Probably Cho Chang. 
um, from <laughs> Harry Potter, <laughs> I think yeah. is, was the first proper one that I know from memory. Um, I think a book that I recommend actually is, um, I read it recently, it's called Wandering Souls. And it's actually not out yet, sorry. I read an advanced copy, but it's out next year. <laughs> and um, Flex. I know, You're sorry. just showing off now. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just so good. It's by Cecile Pin. And I've never ever read a book that was specifically about the experience of forced migrants from Vietnam into the UK and what, what they went through. I think a lot of people don't really talk about it because it's not taught in schools. I think our education could do a lot to be improved and talk about that. But I think... Um, that book was one that I felt really seen because I think it talked about the stories that I went through and um, yeah, I recommend that, Wandering Souls. Mm. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think. I think it's probably the same. I've never read a Harry Potter book, but I, everyone knew about Cho Chang yeah. because there was the, the whole like casting, they were looking for um, a Chinese girl to be part of Harry Potter and I think everyone, I think even my mum here, she's like, oh, you should go audition and I was like, I'm not auditioning to <laughs> And I think like everyone, like any, yeah. you know, Chinese girl during that age was like, oh, you all have to audition and then when, um, um, yeah, uh, I think that was like the, you know, that was the time that I first come across like a Chinese person in literature. Um, but also, like, the laziest name, Cho Chang. Like, I know. Come on. Yeah. Two last names oh, put together. Yeah. Good oh, job. Real name. Oh, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, but a book I would recommend would probably be Kathy Park Hong, My Mind of Feelings. Mm, that was yeah. a great book I read during COVID, um, especially during the height of, like, the COVID-related hate crimes. It really made me rethink and, like, relearn and unlearn things in terms of, like, how, you know, you would approach a situation and I feel like every Asian, East South Asian person should read it because you start to like read it and you're like nodding your head off so much that you're, mm -hmm. you know, your head will probably fall off. You're like, oh my God, like I felt that's the same. And you know, the way that she provides commentary in the situations is also funny and it's also kind of lighthearted. But yeah, I, I totally recommend everyone to read it. It's kind of like the Bible for me, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't really have one from like growing up. Um, I really enjoyed Last Boat Out of Shanghai, which is a journalist's kind of sensationalized recounting of the Cultural Revolution and people leaving China. Um, but actually one book I really resonated with, although a very different experience, is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which talks about a young black girl in, South, uh, in Southern America growing up wanting to be white and have blue eyes. And like, although our experience is very different, the sentiment of, you know, white power was it was the first time I really saw it written out in literature as just they never explicitly said it but it was the way that it was embedded in every single decision these characters made as like kids um, that affected all their li um, like every part of their lives that really I kind of resonated with that sentiment mostly yeah. um, I think with me so I so I have a little girl called Sadie she's four um, and I've been reading some um, books to her, particularly books with um, EC characters. And there's an author called Maisie Chan, who is, her books really represent the um, EC community really fairly, even to the point where um, the characters are illustrated to how we look rather than stereotypical, you know, small eyes so i'd really recommend uh, maisie chan um also uh, take away by angela hoy <laughs> um <laughs> there is angela you have a question here so that question is oh. from naomi thanks naomi who um wrote that i've got one question to angela if you feel comfortable answering this from pauline learn she's put um angela how do you handle the continued challenging conversations with your mum about not having kids Ooh. Ooh. That's a deep one. <laughs> Go on. I mean, I we constantly butt heads, you know, she's always trying to force that on me. And I told her, I was like, I'm not going to have kids, I'm going to have a dog. That's my <laughs> baby. And she's like, I'm allergic to dogs. I'm like, I'm ne fine, never come over there. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's such an ongoing battle. Like, she still forces that every time we go home. And especially, like, big events where we come back together, like Christmas or New Year's. Um, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure that one out. I'm still trying to figure out, like, the conversation around it. I feel like it's, um, she finds, she calls me selfish that I'm not getting married or having kids 
because you know she always thinks like it's your duty to kind of bring on the next generation but i don't think she sees it and i think she's just not ed, you know educated enough in that sense because she's always grown up in a very traditional path in terms of um getting married mm -hmm. having kids getting the next generation providing for the next generation and i'm you know, that's why she calls me selfish. She's like, well, you're kind of stopping the lineage. But I don't see it that way because I see it as, um, you know, I want to do what's right for me. And I've never been the maternal person. I've never had that, oh, I really want a baby or that fresh born baby smell. Like that's never been me. And I've never really, I've always felt really awkward around kids. Like I don't know, <laughs> when someone gives me a baby, I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> what do I do? Like I love playing with other people, like my cousins. And I love playing with um, all my other like uh, family, friends, kids. But I've just never wanted that. And so I'm still figuring out a conversation. I don't know, maybe we'll probably end up falling out over it and I don't know, but I feel like it's just me trying to talk to her and explain the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And I've always said like, you know, I don't want to have kids because one, I think it's fucking expensive to have yeah. kids, right? It's it how is. are you supposed to have a kid? And especially in like today's climate, you know, it's like, global warming and all this, yeah. you know, rising costs of everything and there's overpopulated and it's just like, those are so many reasons why I don't want to have a kid. It's like, I don't want to add to that as well. Yeah. So yeah, there's, it's an ongoing conversation. I, I'll let you know when I find the answer. <laughs> Also, I think it's interesting that like throughout this whole conversation, we've mainly just spoken about our moms, <laughs> and uh, like we haven't actually mentioned our dad as like a solo oh, figure. Yeah. It's always like, our parents mm. or our mom because like the dads are just like the stoic figure at the back, yeah. who will make the mom relay everything to us because yeah. the mom is the one capable of talking about her feelings a little bit. There are like six women in my family and two men, and you can tell when we're around the dinner table. Like my brother and my dad, there's hardly a peep. From them, and it's just me and my sisters going rah, 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 like <laughs> talking over each other. So um, I think my dad just goes with it. He yeah. just goes with it. <laughs> so, um, so that question is from Pauline. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I think we've got time for a few Q and A's in the live audience here. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, oh my God! Oh, this is so <laughs> this anxiety. Um, the oh, just pick someone, please. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, way to show your audience some love. <laughs> uh, hi, hi. Uh, I really enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, myself have been thinking about something I haven't heard many people talking about. Um, I've been thinking about like the kind of uh, uh, the anglicized way of the way we talk about our surnames, mm -hmm. and and because I've been seeing and hearing more about other cultures where they pronounce their names more accurately to the way it should be. Mm. Like, where do you, what, what do you think about that? Like, should we be pronouncing our surnames, especially I think Cantonese, like pronunciation is a little bit harder for mm. like English people. Mm. Should we try to do it properly and introduce mm. ourselves properly? Um, oh, that's a really tough one. I think we were just talking about that quite recently with Han Lee, I don't know where she is. I think um, just with how our names are pronounced. This is just my personal um, opinion. Um, I think if names are mis, as long as people are making the effort to say our names, and even if it's mispronounced, I don't. I, I think I'm okay with that. I don't know if you guys are as well. It's only I think when they. So, for example, my 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 Chinese name is is Ma Puyu, um, but I also have a, a British name as well, but. If, for example, I didn't have the British name and my full name was, is Ma Puyu, and if someone said to me, oh, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm just going to call you Paul or whatever, I think then that would be, I would find it a bit offensive. But if someone mispronounced my name, Ma Puyu, then I think, it, I think I'd be okay with it because at least they're trying. Mm. I don't know about... Yeah. I think, it's, yeah. I think it's, that's a very interesting point. I've not really thought about it. Um, in Hong Kong, for me, like... Like Jason was, I was born with that name, and so with my Chinese name. But I also lived in Shanghai, so then I would say my name in Mandarin. Um, and so when I've come over here, I'm like, well, like, in a way, I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> so I was just like, just and like, I remember people would ask me, say, is it Quan or is it Quan or is it Quan? And people would always get it wrong or say something different. And I remember thinking, like, I don't really know how to say it in English because it's not an English word. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely think like each to one's own. Uh, I think it's a really good 
Yeah, really good point. I'm going to start thinking about that and mm. forcing people to say my name properly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have to say, um, I have a four-year-old daughter too, and um, trying to teach her Cantonese, doing really badly at it, by the way. Um, and yeah, we have books where we talk through s certain words, and I try and read in Cantonese. And uh, my partner, who, bless him, he does try, but sometimes he gets the tone wrong, and I actually have to say don't, because you're going to teach her the wrong tone, and it's so hard to learn from such a young age. And I feel if someone gets a tone wrong, it's a feeling in me. It's like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> and <laughs> I can't like deal with it, because I know it's a completely wrong tone. It has a different meaning. And so I think that's why I just say, you know, my name's Amy Fung, but I don't go, I'm Amy Fong, because I just feel like, that's going to take someone a while. I mean, I think the, if the intention was there, I would definitely own it and start asking mm. people to call me Fongame. Mm. Um, but I just think um, the effort it would take is quite a lot. Mm. Um, I think it has to be a mass movement. We need to start a petition, use our mm. um, names of our heritage. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm the same as you two with Georgie as well. I think I used to be really bothered by it, you know, because I feel like people used to pick on me for my name. So they would call me like Ahoy or Hui, Hu, or like, and it really frustrated me. And I was like, pronounce my name properly, Alex. It's not hard. Um, but, you know, I think it was just a lot of aggression on taking it out on people. But as I've gotten older, I think I've, you know, even I don't even know how to pronounce my name. It's like, it's a weird, like, hoi, you know, it's like low high, like, how do you even say it? And plus, in like Mandarin, it's like, sure, it's like, sounds completely different. So it's like, yeah. what? Um, but um, I feel like I'm not, like, as long as it's like the intention, it's not out of malice, then that's okay in terms of like, you know, you're trying. Um, but like recently, I like put my Chinese name in like my like Twitter and my like social media, and I was like, it was such an emotional moment because I've never really put my Chinese name out there or anything, mm -hmm. and um, for it to kind of like see it in like a you know in pixels online, you're like, oh my god, like I've actually never like acknowledged my Chinese name because I've always been so embarrassed by it, and then you're suddenly like faced with it. Um, it's such a very empowering feeling to be able to like, oh, I have two names. Like that's such a cool thing to say. Yeah. Like mm. I've got, I've got more names than you. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've always said like, if it's not out of malice and they're trying, then it's not too bad. But just yeah, maybe we should petition. You know, yeah. call us by our Chinese names forever now. <laughs> we should just completely change our names to the Chinese characters. Mm. Just leave yeah. it without <laughs> the English. So you're, you're embarrassed for different reasons. So mm. like for me, like my Chinese name is embarrassing. <laughs> like it means like my last name, and then it's like intelligent, clever, and I'm. It's like I don't want to be saying that to people all the time. <laughs> like I, mean, I like that. <laughs> I think so it's, but it's like so Cantonese. I feel like what is your Cantonese. Name? What is your Chinese name? Wan Zi Chong. So like Zi Wai Chong Ming. Chong Ming. Ah. And it's just like, like <laughs> so like my mom wants me to be the smart kid. So she's like, I'm gonna name him Smart <laughs> <Yeah>. Smart. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, mom. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like with Cantonese naming, it's like it has a purpose and I know. It's I, really and I like that. And it's sweet. Yeah. You know, my my Chinese name is Hoi Zi Yan, mm. which means like Purple Grace. You know, yeah. I'm not gonna be called Purple Grace. Like, what the hell? Like, yeah. people start singing Purple Rain to me, you know? <laughs> and, but my parents were, you know, we were all called Zi something. So oh, I was like, yeah. um, my brother said Zi Gin, Zi Hong, health. Yeah. And I came to be Zi Yan, which is like a bit more feminine. So, yeah. you know, there's always meaning behind it, but I quite like having the meaning. You know, it's like yeah. a double entendre. Like, oh, I mean, yeah, yours is really nice, though. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think we might have time for one, maybe two more. The lady in the uh, purple. Sorry. Yeah. Um, God, it is really refreshing listening to you guys. I am actually your mum's generation. <laughs> Yay, so Auntie. I, Auntie. 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 <laughs> and I, I honestly, you guys represent my children. And one of my girls, right, I got four children, one of my girls, one day she said to me, she said, Mum, you never hug me. Oh. You never why? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with us? And then I said, and actually shocked me because I never actually thought about that. And then I thought, yeah, maybe you're right. But I said, this is me. I can't do anything yeah. different, you know? And she was crying her eyes out. Aww. And then I thought to myself, how am I going to change that? And you know what? To change a lifetime habit is so difficult. Mm -hmm. So what I started doing was, in my text, I say, I love you. Aww. It was like a one-off thing. And then they sort of, they thought, oh, mom, this is so nice. 
I sound like your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like your daughter. That's really sweet, that is. But you know what? I've yeah. never actually thought about that. I've never actually thought about how, how my mum would feel because I'd be like, Mum, tell me you love me. Give me a hug. <laughs> it's, quite, it's really refreshing to, yeah. hear, to hear your and, sound. And the other thing is, I just wonder because it's so different, our upbringing and yours upbringing. And it's hard for us to understand you guys. But because I thought, okay, we're living in London now, or in England. So I tried to change. So I always sort of turn a blind eye to what my children do. Because I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I can't be, you know, one of my daughters is really, really naughty. And she, <laughs> she was doing all sorts of naughty things. <laughs> You know, and it's a part of growing up. So mm. I'm so glad I let her do it. I mean, if I was living in Malaysia, I mean, she would be like, you know, I would probably tie her up in a room. <laughs> <or something like. laughs> anyway, it, it's so refreshing listening to you guys. Thank oh, you. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, just, oh. just to quickly respond, respond to that as well, I think, you know, if I, if I were thinking about what I would like from my mom, for example, I would love for her to ask me, like, how would you like for me to show you that I love you? Because we have such different ways, like love language is so different from generation to generation, from culture to culture. If she asked me, I'll be like, you can do this, this and that, and I will feel love, just take those boxes and maybe she can do it, maybe she can't, but like at least she would know. And I think the fact that now you know what your daughter, you know, reacts to and what they like, like I think that's beautiful. Well, you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. I love that growth because I think um, when I said I'm talking as a mother, I know that there are certain things that my parents gave me that I'm really proud of and that I can continue and pass on to my daughter. But there are things also that I want to take that I've learned. Like, you know, I say I love you to my daughter a lot. I probably overcompensate mm. completely. I hug her loads. Mm. She's like, get off me. <laughs> and um, I think it's really great to have all that mixing pot of different influences feed into someone who now I have to take care of. And um, yeah, I, I think with my parents, I think their, their growth is gonna come eventually. I hope so, I hope one day. And I, I know I have to initiate that, you know, like you say, I need to start talking about it. But certainly with my own daughter, it's like breaking certain cycles and starting new ones. Mm. Such a lovely um, question uh, or comment to end on. So it's come to the end of our show. So I feel like I have to really reach down to say hi, say hi to this little crew here. <laughs> come to the end of the show. Thank you so much to the panelists here. <laughs> and um, honestly, I am so, I was quite nervous when I came up, so I feel like I didn't really say everything I wanted to say. But thank you so much to the British Library for actually putting on an exhibition on British and Chinese. No way, it's so weird. <laughs> so cool as well. Um, <laughs> um, I really hope this is the first of many more exhibitions to come talking about the EC uh, community in the UK. Um, the British Chinese uh, exhibition is on until the 23rd of April. 23rd of April, yep, yeah, thank you, whoever said that, yep. Yeah. <laughs> 23rd of April, it's a free exhibition, it's just downstairs as well, it's amazing. Um, I'd really encourage uh, you all to go down. So thank you so much, guys. It's, I think Hanley's coming back up. Can we plug ourselves? Is she coming? Oh. Huh? Can we plug ourselves? Can we plug ourselves? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> you just, know what, I, I do work in my health promo. Um, no no shame. Not, even, not even for me, but like, um, so the, the Bit and Peach, which is the queer Asian cabaret that um, I'm part of, we're doing two theater shows on December 2nd and 3rd at the Pleasance Theater. Oh, it's gonna be a huge really? celebration of just Asian talent. It's gonna be drag, it's gonna be live music, it's gonna be stupid, it's gonna be camp. Like, <laughs> if you'd like to go, please come. It's gonna be amazing. Um, they're kind of like our, end of year rap shows and in Jan end of January 2023 we throw a Lunar New Year party and we have loads nice. of events so if you have nowhere to celebrate Lunar New Year come do it with the queer as fuck Bit and Peach <laughs> and you can find it um, I'm at Jason Kwan Music on Instagram and Bit and Peach UK as well thank you Angela.
That sounds amazing. Yeah. That's super fun. Yeah. That's and fun. do you know where can we find you as well? If you want to find um, you on Instagram or social yeah, media. I mean, is it there? I don't know. Um, probably not. <laughs> so like, um, at Twitter, I'm like at Ange Angela underscore Hoy. And then uh, Instagram is at An Angela H-U-I-I, because someone stole my name. So, very <laughs> no annoying. Is um, Angela Hoy out there? I know. And I'm like, I want that Instagram <laughs> handle. It's just an empty account. Like, come on. <laughs> um, I, and I guess you can find me in my work through uh, a lot of the mainstream like media, through, I don't know, like Time Out, Financial Times, Guardian. And uh, I mainly work at Recce, which is the um, like f food ordering app, which is for like chefs and suppliers. Um, you can buy my book. Oh, God, I hate talking about my book. <laughs> I've talked about my books, like, nonstop since July, so I'm, like, really sick of it. You can buy it. You don't have to buy it. I don't mind. But, yeah, my book. <laughs> book buy it. Go buy it. Buy it. It's so good. <laughs> um, book is called Takeaway, um, and, yeah, it's about my life, growing up at the Chinese Takeaway in the rural Wales, um, and it's out everywhere, and the paperback's coming out next year, so if you hate hardback, it's a wait for it. Um, but I also did the audio book, so you can listen to my really annoying Welsh voice. <laughs> I love your voice. Oh, God, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I also did the audiobook if you want to listen to it. Um, but yeah, that's mainly me. Oh, nice. Where can we find you, Amy? Yeah, um, if you like food pictures, me moaning about stuff, or anything of that kind, then <laughs> I'm on underscore Amy underscore Pix, P I X. But more importantly, you should follow BC in for relevant content. Yeah. <laughs> that's at B E S E A dot N on Instagram and an underscore instead for Twitter. Cool. And I'm on Instagram, Chinese Chippy Girl. I'm kind of on Twitter, Madam Scoop, but to be honest with you, I only use Twitter when I'm complaining to customer services. <laughs> There's my parcel. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. I think Hanley's going to come up. Okay. Thank you very much for our wonderful guest speakers tonight in conversation with us. Really appreciate that you accept our invitation and willing to share the story with us. Particularly, it's not easy and to the, pop, uh, to the public. Really appreciate and thank you. Thank you to Georgie Ma, Ma Po Yu, <laughs> Amy Fong, <laughs> Fong Gan Moi, Angela Hoi, Hoi Ji Yam, and Jason Guan, Guan Ji Tong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we, also, can we also give it up for Han Lee, who is Taiwanese mm. but learned all of our Cantonese names? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I also would like to thank you all for being our audience today on, uh, at the British Library and online. Thank you for joining us in the event. <laughs> We'd love to welcome you back again to the British Library for more events, performance, conversations. So please do keep an eye on, on our What's On website to find out more events associated to the exhibitions. Once again, the exhibition will open until 23rd April 2023. So please do come and visit us. You can also view the past uh, events on our uh, British Library viewer. So do come and join us. Thank you all again. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.